With COVID-19 forcing Joe Biden to deliver his acceptance speech virtually, we get a unique perspective on both the pandemic and Biden himself with our next guest. Ron Klain was President Obama's Ebola czar, and before that, he was Vice President Biden's chief of staff, and he remains one of his closest advisors. Here he is now telling our Walter Isaacson how Biden would marshal the nation to defeat the virus and why he is the man for the top job now. Thanks, Chris John and Ron Klain. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Walter. Thanks for having me. You were the Ebola czar. What things did you do to get that under control? That might be lessons for us today. Well, first of all, we really started with uh, a whole of government response, uh, really throwing everything we could at it. Uh, in that case, the disease was largely overseas. We needed to do some preparations here in the U.S. It was a, an international response that we were a part of. But I think the most important thing we did differently is we put science first. Uh, President Obama made it very clear that while I was coordinating the logistics of the response, trying to get it organized, making it happen, that the strategy came from people like Tony Fauci, came from Tom Frieden, who ran the Centers for Disease Control, Dr. Nikki Lurie, who ran the uh, preparedness unit over at HHS. We had medical experts uh, determining what the strategy should be, and we took their advice and direction. I think from the start here, President Trump has allowed kind of politics and political imperatives to suppress the science. He has denied the threat. That's another big difference, which is that President Obama was very candid with the American people about the fact that we had a big Ebola problem in Africa. We were going to see some cases in the U.S. We needed to get ready for it. We needed to get our system prepared for it. We needed to screen. We needed to test. We needed to get hospitals ready. We needed to buy equipment. And we went and did all those things. President Trump's approach, particularly early on, has been to deny that there was a problem, say it was going to go away, say it would go away like a miracle. We didn't assume with Ebola it was going to go away like a miracle. We didn't assume it would go away when it got hot. We fought that disease every day in West Africa with preparations in the U.S. to get it under control and to eventually extinguish that epidemic. What are the biggest failures happening right now in the coronavirus response? Well, I think the biggest failure, if you had to summarize it in a sentence, is a lack of a national strategy. I mean, we're facing a global pandemic. And the president's basically walked off the field and said it's up to each state to sort out. So we have 50 state testing strategies, 50, te 50 tracing strategies, uh, you know, 50 strategies on uh, PPE and protective gear, shutting down, opening up schools. We just kind of left every one of these states on their own. And that's no way to fight a challenge like this. We need national leadership. We need a national strategy. We need the unique tools that only the federal government can muster to face a challenge like the one we're facing. Bill Gates on this show said that the CDC should be having one website and one strategy to do testing, get testing out, and get results back quickly. Would that be possible? Uh, I think it would be possible, whether it should be the CDC or some other uh, entity in the federal government. I mean, I think there's a lot of ways to structure it. You could have a special agency do it. Uh, Vice President Biden, for example, has called for a pandemic testing board that would sit above all the other agencies to organize a strategy. But Mr. Gates is absolutely right. What we need is a coordinated federal strategy to drive testing and to drive tracing. I mean, testing is just one part of this, Walter. It's a critical part, no question. But once we have the results, we need to do something with the results. And that involves what epidemiologists call contact tracing. If you or I test positive, we wanna know who, who, who we were in contact with, who should be isolated, uh, who we should make sure they're not spreading the disease to others. That's a lot of hard work. Uh, Vice President Biden's called for 100,000 contact tracers close, coast to coast to do that work, but that also has to go hand in hand with the testing. And how would we increase uh, the critical supplies to make it work better? What would you have done? So one thing the president could have done as early as March was invoke the Defense Production Act, which is a legal authority the president has to require the private sector to produce more goods. I mean, one of the problems here is that in the absence of the federal government ordering and paying for all these testing supplies, private companies have said, you know, I keep hearing that these new tests will come online. I keep hearing that we'll get these instant tests, a new saliva test, a new antigen test. And so I don't want to make all this stuff for the old tests because then no one will buy it, right? And so the private sector hasn't really ramped up to the extent that it could. The answer should have been back in March, even back in February, frankly, for the president to use his legal authority to say, 
the federal government will buy the test supplies, the federal government will buy the equipment, the federal government will buy the chemicals and pay for the manufacturer all this so we will have enough of it. The private sector incentives aren't right by themselves. This is the kind of crisis that requires a real intervention by the federal government. Down here at Tulane, where I teach, we're bringing students back carefully day after day in waves, testing them and trying to make it work with hybrid classes and online. But the University of North Carolina, which also tried to do it carefully, just had to shut down the campus itself and go totally online. What's your level of concern as colleges across the country return? Well, I think there should be a level of concern about it. I think that, uh, again, I think that uh, educational institutions, I know are trying to do the right thing and trying to uh, balance their educational priorities uh, with the need of keeping students and faculty and staff safe. It's gonna be a big challenge because frankly, uh, you know, colleges and universities, they don't exist separately from our society. They're not a separate island. And unlike the National Basketball Association, you cannot put them in a bubble completely. Uh, and isolate them in the way that the NBA has successfully isolated itself. So they're exposed to and vulnerable to the same things that are going wrong with our country as a whole. If we don't have this disease under control, which we don't, and if we don't have a national strategy to fight it, which we don't, uh, then what's going to happen at colleges and universities is the same thing that's happening every place else, which is the disease will continue to spread. Uh, we won't have enough procedures, testing, tracing in place to get it under control. And I think that's the challenge that colleges and universities are facing. Uh, they're part of the society. They don't exist separate from it. New Zealand just locked down parts of Auckland uh, because there were 29 cases uh, discovered. Yeah. Do you think we should try in this country to have such measures where you can quickly try to shut down any outbreak? Well, I think we need a national strategy around fighting COVID. And that strategy, you know, a number of countries have done it differently, but what they've all done it successfully is by having a clear focused strategy. Uh, for example, uh, last week, uh, Vice President Biden called for a national nationwide masking mandate to have every one of the states, not just most, but every one of the states have masking mandatory when we are around other people. And uh, that's a strategy that's worked in some countries. I think uh, potentially selectively shutting down places that are seeing flare-ups is a strategy that has worked in some countries. Uh, certainly much more robust testing and tracing regimes have worked in some countries. Uh, and in the meantime, the federal government is providing no guidance or reversing guidance. We've seen with regard to schools, the Centers for Disease Control at first issue guidelines about how to open schools safely. Then the political figures in the administration said, oh, that's just too rigorous, it's too tough. President spent a month saying basically that like the CDC guidelines shouldn't be a barrier to reopening and then withdrew the CDC guidelines and had the CDC issue new, much more vague guidelines. So uh, I don't think it's a question of uh, which of these strategies would work. It's about having a strategy that is up to the challenge. And we don't have that right now. Uh, you were chief of staff to uh, Vice President Biden once and you've been a long time uh, uh, advisor to him. Tell me about what it's like to brief him and talk to him about coronavirus. Well, he's been very engaged uh, right since the start, all the way back in January. He wrote an op-ed in USA Today warning about the potential pandemic, warning that the president wasn't ready for it. Uh, he reiterated those warnings in February, again, when few other political figures were talking about the coronavirus threat, saying that the Chinese government wasn't being transparent, wasn't allowing our people on the ground in the right places at a time when President Trump was busy praising the Chinese government's handling of this. And throughout this, he's been outspoken, he's been engaged. He gets briefed regularly by leading scientists in the field. Those briefings are led by Dr. David Kessler, the former head of the FDA, and Dr. Vivek Murthy, the former Surgeon General of the United States. There's an entire team of experts that he consults regularly. I'm sure Vice President Biden's spending more time getting briefed by experts about COVID than the president is. That's the kind of person he was when he was in the White House in terms of getting his intelligence briefings and taking threats like this to the American people very seriously. Look, uh, as the vice president's been very candid about saying, the president can't keep bad things from happening. The president can't say that nothing bad will ever happen on his or her watch. But what the president can do is two things, which is to, uh, is to really be fully engaged and respond and to take responsibility when things go wrong. And uh, President Trump's done neither of those two things. Joe Biden would do both of those things. 
The Trump campaign's latest ads depict Joe Biden as being addled, getting old, no longer mentally totally with it. You deal with him quite a bit. How would you counter that? I counter that by saying that uh, obviously he's very on top of things. And the American people will see this for themselves. They have seen this for themselves. He gave a speech last week where he announced the uh, selection of his running mate, Senator Harris, and everyone in America could watch that speech and make their own assessment of uh, Joe Biden's capacity and his sharpness. I think he seemed very capable and very sharp. Uh, He is when we talk to him about issues, whether that's COVID or the economy or the racism crisis. Uh, The American people will get to see the vice president again firsthand during the convention. And of course, ultimately in the fall, they'll see him go one-on-one with President Trump in three debates. And I think they can compare head to head which of these two men has more capacity and capability to be president of the United States. I'm very confident how that will come out. There's some criticism, too, of the vice president for what are called the basement tapes, that he seems to be hunkered down, that he's not out there. Will he be able to get out there more? Well, you know, he has said that he is going to conduct his campaign in a way that's responsible and that's uh, safe. And so he has been. Uh, doing speeches, but obviously in socially distanced settings. Uh, He has been uh, visiting places in a very responsible way. I'll tell you what he's not going to do, Walter. He's not going to do events like President Trump did uh, in Tulsa, um, where he basically uh, created like a super spreader event, where like we've seen a bunch of uh, COVID uh, spread as a result of that. Uh, He's not going to do things that put people at risk by virtue of his campaigning. And so, yes, it is going to be I mean, I love campaigns. I love the events. I love the rallies. I love going to them. I love being a staffer at them. That's not what the fall is going to look like. Will he travel? Yes, as he has. Will he appear in places? Yes, as he has. But it is going to be a very different kind of campaign, uh, at least on the Biden side, because we're not going to spread this disease uh, in the interest of politics. He's going to act responsibly uh, like, uh, like anyone should. In the convention, for all the way it's being done by Zoom. Isn't there something lost when there's no crowd reactions? Sure. I mean, there's definitely something lost by not being able to do the kind of convention that we have. There's something lost by not being able to send our children to school safely. There's something lost by not being able to watch football games this fall. There's, you know, this country has lost a lot because of Donald Trump's mismanagement of the COVID crisis. And of course, it's lost more than 170,000 lives most poignantly. I think on that list of losses, the absence of cheering crowds in a convention hall is not on the top of the list. But sure, I would much rather be in Milwaukee right now, uh, in the hall, seeing old friends and seeing people react to it and having the kinds of um, amazing experiences that a political convention is. This is that. Uh, But I think in that way, it's very fitting of what we're going through as a country. Uh, And the kind of convention we're seeing uh, from the Democrats and that we will see from the Republicans is sadly the product of uh, the Trump administration's mismanagement of this crisis. Now, we're going to make lemonade out of lemons. And I think we are putting on uh, a very strong convention program with the limitations that we have. Uh, Joe Biden's known very well for being able to walk, walk across the aisle. What compromises would he make? What would he give up in order to get a new coronavirus uh, relief bill? Well, I mean, first and foremost, Walter, he would start by sitting down and talking to the leaders in both parties and trying to put this together. I mean, you can't pass legislation standing in a sand, sand trap at the Bedminster Country Club. That's not the way you're going to get things done. And what I can tell you is what Joe Biden would be doing is be meeting with the Democrats and the Republicans in the House and Senate, trying to find a way to get a package passed. And I'm pretty confident that he would get that done. Look, we all know what needs to happen here, right? We need to fix the post office and get it funded to resolve that crisis that Trump's created. And then on COVID, we know what we need to do. We know that we need to get aid to the people who are hurting. We need to get aid to state and local governments that are strapped by the consequences of this. We need to make sure that businesses have the tools they need to reopen safely with the right gear and right protections, right reconfigurations. We need to make sure our schools have the support they need to be able to teach people either remotely where that has to be or to the extent they can do in-person instruction with safety protection for the teachers and the schools. So I mean, those are the basic things that need to happen. I don't think it's that 
complicated, but it requires presidential leadership. And the president simply golfing and tweeting is not going to get that done. Do you think the original payroll protection program shortchanged Main Street? And if so, what would Biden do about that? Well, first of all, we know that uh, the money didn't go to all the places it should have. We know that some people got it who shouldn't have gotten it. We know that um, a lot of businesses, particularly minority-oriented businesses, uh, didn't, didn't get their loans approved under that. Uh, so I think making sure uh, that, uh, that aid to business really gets to Main Street, really gets to the people who are hurting, is an important thing that Vice President Biden has emphasized. He's also emphasized something that, uh, that our businesses really need, particularly smaller businesses that are struggling to reopen. You know, they need special aid to help reopen. People who are trying to reopen and put up plexiglass shields, who are trying to equip their workers with the right protective gear, they need help to do that. They need both clear guidance about that and they need financial help to do that. And that's the kind of help uh, Joe Biden would provide. I think the thing I hear most often from small business people, Walter, is they just don't know what they're supposed to do. There's just no clear guidance. There's no clear rules. There's no clear set of procedures they're supposed to follow. And I think that's what the federal government should provide first and foremost, and then the resources to help um, you know make all that work. Uh, the Democratic ticket is now pretty far ahead in many of the polls, but so was uh, that the case in 2016. Are you worried? Do you think the Democrats might get overconfident? I don't think anyone is getting overconfident in the Biden campaign. I can tell you that. I think we're going to fight this thing out every single day as hard as if we were two points behind or five points behind or how far behind we have to be to be motivated to fight very, very hard. We all saw what happened in 2016. Uh, we're not going to let that happen again. And we're going to uh, fight our guts out to make sure that doesn't happen again. Uh, I do think that we've got a great ticket in Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. I think that's a great asset to us in terms of winning this election. But I also think there's one other thing, which is that Donald Trump was able to run in 2016 a little bit as all things to all people. He was kind of a, a well-known unknown in the sense that he was a very famous person. But people really didn't know what he stood for or what he would do. They didn't know what kind of president he would be. He was able to present an image of someone who was a successful businessman and able to run on that image. And I think what's really different three years later is that we, he has a track record. And it's a track record of spectacular and horrific failure. He is headed into a reelection right now as the first president since Herbert Hoover to lose jobs on his presidency. He's seen a death toll from the coronavirus pandemic uh, that is unmatched by uh, even the death toll of World War II. We're losing more Americans each month to COVID than we lost in the average month of World War II. Uh, he's in the middle of a racism crisis that his only solution for is just more divisiveness. And so I think uh, what really is different about 2016 and 2020 is the fact that President Trump has to be accountable for his record. He can't run, fr he can't run away from it, he can't run on it. And so I think that that's, uh, that's a, a major difference between this year and four years ago. Ron Klain, thank you so much for joining us. Paltrow, thanks for having me.